So go, good morning, uh, everybody. My name is uh, Laura Hernand from France. I'm co-chairing this session with Le Lukas Szanowski from Poland. And uh, this is a very special session because this is the first joint session between two groups of young cardiologists within the European Society of Cardiology, the cardiologist of tomorrow from the ESC, and the club 35 from the European Association of Echocardiography. And this is also a live streaming session. So uh, we have a web moderator that is Mette Marie Madsen. And you can ask a question uh, through, the, through the website and uh, through normal way, of course. Uh, we are welcoming um, also our virtual uh, audience from uh, all around the world, I hope. And uh, we will try to start this very practical session about pocket echo devices. And we will start with the first speaker, which is Piotr Lipiec from Poland that is uh, talking about how to perform examination with pocket echocardiography. Uh, dear Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to this very interesting session. And um, I'd like to begin uh, with, of course, first my disclosure slide containing uh, potential conflicts of interest pertaining to the topic of the presentation. And I'd like to begin by highlighting the document which um, forms uh, the official basis for this session and will be mentioned on numerous occasions during my presentation and I'm sure during uh, my, my colleague's presentation as well. As well. And the document is a position statement of the European Association of Echocardiography on the use of pocket size imaging devices. It was published in 2011 and I highly, highly re recommend to you downloading it and getting yourself familiar with it. My presentation is uh, intended as a practical introduction to the use of um, pocket size uh, echo, so it will be a sort of user's manual. You, you can see the structure of the presentation, and I would like to start with uh, a few sli slides of the technical background. Uh, as you probably have noticed, uh, there has been a lot of confusion regarding terminology. You could have heard uh, different uh, names, uh, mobile, portable, handheld, pocket devices, echocardiographs. Uh, now um, it's much simpler. Um, this is the table from uh, the document that I've mentioned. As you see, EAE has categorized the echo machines into four groups. And the fourth category is the one that we will be talking about today and the official name is handheld or pocket size imaging devices. So the question that comes to our mind is, is it really pocket size or is it a bit of an exaggeration? These are the uh, photos that I have taken for you of two commercially available in Europe um, pocket size imaging devices. Uh, I placed them near a standard stethoscope. As you see, uh, they are truly pocket size. Uh, the, for those of you who prefer numbers, the uh, size of the display is um, below. Uh, as you see, the weight uh, differs greatly between those um, two devices. However, I can tell you that both of them will fit into your white pocket coat. Um, since this is a session intended for non-experts, um, the another important question that has to be answered uh, right away is, is it easy to use? Well, this is something that you will have to find out for yourself. But just looking at the control panels of these uh, machines, you see straight away that there are not too many buttons. So um, it's really quite easy to use. And what's important for an uh, echo machine, uh, the booting time is around 10 seconds. Uh, here you see some uh, more detailed technical characteristics. The devices use around 2 to 4 megahertz probes. They both offer grayscale 2D imaging with a sector angle of less than 75 degrees and a sector depth below 25 centimeters. One product offers color flow imaging. Actually, the other one has a button for color flow imaging on its control panel, but the button doesn't work. It's intended for future development. Uh, but the one that has Color flow imaging has a sector angle of 30 degrees with fixed repetition frequency. You can take simple measurements with the device, um, uh, its distance and area. Um, the title of the session is Pocket Echocardiography, and this could imply that this is a device intended uh, mainly chiefly for the heart. Well, that's not really entirely true. Uh, 
because you can use it, of course, for the cardiac examination, but you can also uh, do abdominal examination with it. You can use it in neurology for fetal examination, for peripheral vascular examination, and for detection of pleural fluid. However, if you take a look at the available presets or exa exam types that you can select when you start your examination, you will see that there is only um, there were only a few. There is, of course, a cardiac preset, then there is an abdominal preset, which is um, suggested by a producer for peripheral vascular examination, but as you will later see for vascular examinations, you can also try using cardiac preset and get good results. And there is an obstetric preset. Uh, both products come with a docking station that uh, allow you to connect the device to a computer to charge the battery and to store the device when it's not in use. Interestingly, one of the producers indicates that it's not designed for any vehicles, including ambulances, and it can only be used in-house. And of course, um, when we are talking about such devices, uh, the battery is of the utmost importance. Uh, so. Um, uh, batteries used in these devices allow you to scan for around uh, 60 to 75 minutes. Uh, then you have to recharge the battery, which takes from 1.5 to 2.5 hours. Fortunately, uh, you may get a spare battery, which may be charged outside the device together with um, the device. So in one pocket, you can carry around the device, and in, in the other, the spare battery. And now we can move. Uh, to examination. Of course, before we start uh, thinking about examination, we must inform the patient clearly uh, what uh, the procedure will be uh, like. And uh, there is a strong EAE recommendation about patient information. Uh, as you see, PSID, which stands here for Pocket Size Imaging Devices, um, does not provide or replace complete diagnostic echo. And the patient should be clearly informed about it. So he should know that this is not a, an echo that he is undergoing, a complete echo. Um, starting an examination, of course, has to begin with patient identification. And here, options are quite limited. Of course, there is an ID number, uh, but usually that's not sufficient. One product, as you have probably noticed, has a keypad on which you can introduce patient's name. And the other one offers voice recording, so you can just record your own, uh, yourself uh, saying patient's name. Now we can move to the examination itself. And um, the examination has to start with us deciding which views we want to get, uh, what we want to see. When you look at the literature, you will see that there are two types of examination protocols. There are uh, pathology-oriented protocols where you look for, uh, look at specific abnormality. abnormality. And uh, these are, this is usually performed for, uh, during bedside monitoring of patients with known pathology when you want to change, uh, observe um, changes over time of uh, a known pathology. Or it can be done during screening for specific pathology. The other group of protocols is just overall assessment of cardiac morphology and function. And I will start with uh, some examples of pathology-oriented protocols. Probably the most commonly one used is uh, the assessment of global of re and regional left ventricular systolic function. Um, and it's usually done in patients suspected of or, or having heart failure, like the patient that uh, is shown on this slide, or patients with acute coronary syndromes. Other examples of pathology-oriented protocols include assessment of inferior vena cava diameter and respiratory variations, detection of pericardial effusion, and right ventricular dilatation, uh, shown here in this um, slide. Um, another example of such protocol is assessment of abdominal aorta and screening for um, a aortic aneurysm as uh, shown in this paper with very good results. And the last example of pathology-oriented protocol that I want to show you uh, is a vascular examination. This is actually a patient who has been uh, hospitalized in our center um, quite recently. And uh, after uh, catheterization uh, he had, um, at the puncture site, he had a suspicion of complication. And uh, as you see, the 
um, pocket device allowed us to detect, uh, to see the pseudoaneurysm. Uh, the image on the left was acquired with abdominal preset. The image on the right was abdominal with cardiac preset. So as you see, uh, using both presets will allow you to get decent images. So now we are moving towards the uh, protocol of overall assessment uh, of cardiac morphology and function. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is how complete, how long should such protocol be? Because, of course, the longer we take to examine the patients, the more diagnostic information we will get. Such line is much steeper for expert users than for novice users who will take more time to examine and get probably less information. But in both cases, we need to decide where we want to be, at the top here, at the bottom, or somewhere in the middle. Well, that really depends. This is a table from the recommendations, European recommendations. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it because this is a topic of uh, Raphael's talk, uh, the next presentation. I just want to show you that there are different scenarios. There are scenarios in which you have a reasonable amount of time to examine the patient, such as the first scenario, which is cardiac counseling in or outside healthcare facilities. And there are scenarios in which you have a very limited time window for examinations. And this is, um, for example, a scenario two, where you, has, you have fast initial screening in an emergency setting, or the fourth one, first, first cardiac evaluation in ambulances. So uh, I think that you should really tailor uh, your examination to the scenario uh, in which you find yourself. Uh, this is a, an example of uh, a protocol which is quite thorough. This is from uh, one of the papers from our center. As you see uh, in this paper, we've measured cardiac chamber size. We've assessed semi-quantitative LV function. Uh, we've looked at the valvular regurgitation, the uh, turbulence of flow through the valve, the morphology of the valves, and uh, um, inferior vena cava diameter and respiratory collapse. But uh, some uh, investigators go even further. In this study um, from Norway, uh, they've done, in all patients, they've done cardiac screening as well as abdominal screening. Interestingly, they've done it in uh, less than um, seven minutes. Um, but uh, they, in almost 50% of patients, they managed to get uh, valuable information. Once we know which views we want to get, uh, we need to uh, optimize the images. Well, here the options are, again, quite limited. Um, for grayscale imaging, we can adjust the depth, we can adjust the get overall gain, and we can uh, use the automatic function um, which optimizes the settings based on the current acquisition, depending on the product. It's called either auto-optimize auto or TGO, which stands for tissue grayscale optimization. Uh, what's important is that if, if you change the view if you change, and the gain, uh, and the depth, sorry, then you need to activate this function once again because it's, it optimizes the settings based on the current acquisition. For, college, for color imaging, you can move around the color box and you can adjust the overall gain. Uh, once you are happy with your images, you should start, start thinking about storing them. Uh, because as EAE recommends, image data should be stored according to national regulations. Of course, storing frozen images is simple, but uh, with storing scene loops, uh, it's more difficult because the device doesn't have uh, an ECG module. So you can either manually define the scene loops or you can rely on the device to store, to store it for you. Uh, one product has an auto cycle feature which, de which detects cyclicity of the ultrasound data and uh, tries to detect a cardiac cycle. Uh, it works in the range of the heart rate be between 50 and 100 uh, beats per minute. Uh, have, however, if the cyclicity data is poor or the um, heart rate is outside of this range, uh, it will store just two second scene loops. What's important to remember is that the detected start, start and stop times are not necessarily in phase with the QRS complex. Um, once we've stored the images and ended the examination, uh, we can start thinking about another important uh, point, which is image viewing. That's especially important for non-experts who will probably want to get a second opinion from the consultant. Well, you can view the stored images on the um, 
device. You can transfer the data to external computer using the dedicated software via USB port. And the third solution is really more practical one. It's not the one recommended by the producer. Uh, you can just uh, remove the micro SD card from the device and uh, use the card reader on your laptop or in any other external computer and open it with any uh, video uh, playing software uh, because uh, it's saved in MP4 format. The other product has a much more complicated format of storage so you need a dedicated software for this. An interesting option for viewing images was proposed in uh, one of papers from the last year. Uh, it was a uh, paper where it was a study uh, where a physician went to Honduran village, acquired images, uh, uploaded it uh, via internet to server from which they were downloaded via Wi-Fi to a smartphone of another physician uh, who was based in um, USA. So uh, as you see, probably in the near future we would be able to send our images to a consultant who is on another floor and that, um, does get um, a second opinion. Reporting is uh, the last part of the examination. Uh, nevertheless, it's quite, uh, it's, it's very important. And as EA recommends, uh, imaging assessment with the pocket size imaging device should be reported as part of physical examination. And the last thing, which is not really a part of examination, but is quite important, is the reimbursement. And here I want to quote exactly the uh, position statement current generation pocket size imaging devices do not allow complete diagnostic examination and should be rather regarded as a tool to complement physical examination. Therefore, no reimbursement should be warranted." End of quote. And that's my final slide with some take-home messages. I'd like to say that it's really easy to use. However, the device does not provide or replace complete diagnostic echo. The patient should be informed about it. You should think about adjusting the examination protocol to clinical scenario. Images need to be stored. Uh, the, examination sh the examination should be reported as part of physical examination and do not expect to, pay to get paid extra for this examination. And that's all. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Piotr, for this nice talk. Do we have some questions in the audience? Thank you, that was uh, wonderful. Uh, my name is Henny Ragi, I come from Cairo, Egypt. Uh, we have been using the V-Scan for uh, extensively during mitral balloon velviloplasties uh, to guide us uh, and to when to stop if we get uh, mitral regurgitation because it's just so easy and the color is quite good. And I don't know if Thomas Kellerth is in this room, but the group from Sweden, uh, and I worked with them in Ethiopia, have also been using it exclusively to guide uh, in remote, in, in Africa, in Ethiopia, to guide uh, mitral balloon valerie plus in the room, and I know that he has data for 32 cases, which are, are uh, quite impressive. Maybe one day we'll publish them. But my, my question is about, uh, you said you calculated volumes? No, 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 I, I said that we assess semi-quantitatively, well, visually, the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, whether it's in the, within the normal range or uh, it's uh, slightly reduced or severely reduced. Right, and with, with the, V-scan, uh, the only way you can get the data is to put it on the PC, right? Uh, With the V-scan. You mean the only uh, to, way to you view can the store data. your data is to move it to a PC? Yes, but uh, you can do it, as I said, either via USB port or you can just remove the card and... Uh, is there a card in the V-scan? Yes, there is a micro SD card All and right. it's saved in MP4 format and uh, you can download it to any computer and open it with any... Okay, uh, maybe feature. I'll come and meet you after this session for some help. Thank sure. you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I think that we have one question from Internet. Right. Yes, we have uh, several actually, but uh, 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 Dr. Mathieu from France would like to know what are the costs, what's the, the price for these products? Right. I don't know if I'm <laughs> authorized to say such things during se session. <laughs> I j uh, uh, it's around 6,000 euros. <laughs> Are you from the industry?
But if we are talking about price, I just want to say that I think that the breakthrough is very near, because right now we have to say that they are quite costly. But uh, in the United States, there are already devices approved by the FDA, which are based uh, on smartphones. And uh, you just plug in the ultrasound probe, and they are much cheaper. So uh, they, are not, they do not have yet a C mark for Europe. Uh, so they are not available in Europe, but maybe uh, in some time they will. So we might expect a uh, uh, decrease in price, I hope. We'll take a last short question. Okay. Um, my question is based on experience in a remote rural uh, part of India and on uh, more than 2,000 plus cases with the V-scan. Uh, I find, number one, um, emergency examinations of uh, children, especially neonates, extremely difficult with this uh, equipment. And uh, the measurements, even just measuring the length, is a little clumsy. Yeah, it takes, it, it takes some time. It, yeah, that's it true. It takes some time. Yeah, because you have to move around the cursor. And, uh, yes. And so what we do is train a technician who not only uh, helps us with the identification, we keep a small notebook, put number one, this patient, and uh, then let the technician do the measurements and you go and supervise later on. It is extremely useful in resource-constrained and manpower-constrained areas where you have to attend uh, dozens of patients in a short time and you move from one center to the other and uh, it's very cost-effective, especially where rheumatic heart disease or tuberculosis is endemic. It really helps um, uh, the management of such Thank you. Patients. Thank you very I much for the comment. I think it's very valuable what you've said because uh, right now our limited our uh, experience worldwide is quite limited. So any experience coming also from, uh, as you've said, rural uh, areas uh, is very valuable for all of us. And I think we are still learning how to um, use this device and uh, how the protocol should look like. All right. Thank you very much. We have to move on. Thanks very much. And the next speaker is Rafael Vidal Perez from Santiago de Compostela, Spain, and his presentation will provide an answer to the question, when and who should do it? Rafael. Thanks for your presentation. I will try to um, orient the, the answer. I think I will not have the uh, complete answer and the uh, third time line. So uh, they are chairman, they are colleagues, uh, they are a virtual audience also. Uh, thanks for the invitation. So I don't have any conflict of interest. Um, my talk will be about when and who should do it. I will come to the beginning. What is the examination that, that we have? You know, the stethoscope means seen through the chest. So the instrument that we commonly call stethoscope, so we really call stethophone. So maybe this pocket machine will be the real stethoscope. We will see the heart. So we could pass from Lenek to this. And how it was the cardiac examination? May, maybe you could see in these pictures that you will be fired in actual times if you continue to do that kind of examination. <laughs> so we change of tools. <laughs> then we take the lay neck instrument, and if you see here in all the all the timeline, we need near 100 years to come to another instruments, and get, we get the phonocardiogram. If I show this to my partners, maybe they don't know what is this. Maybe you learn it in the, in the university. If you see this, you will understand what is happening behind and also in this picture, aortic regurgitation or this one, that mitral regurgitation. So the time is moving. And the echocardiography came. And it takes also time from the Doppler effect, the first 2D imaging, the first multi uh, I approach 2D, you probably will manage what is this. Maybe if I do, do like this, it seems like a parasternal, parasternal mode, and this is how they look for the echo in the 70s. So in 25 years, we develop the transitional probe, and we get to the tissue Doppler, and so on. When I born in 1978, somebody thought about first handheld echo machine, but we need time to get the first handheld echo machines, more or less. So we come to 10,010 for the last model. So the timeline is going fast. 2,000 years palpation to auscultation. 150 years to echo, 50 years to pocket echo. So the things are running fast. 
let's talk about this machine. When I should do it, who should do it? I will try to answer with three examples from the cardiologist's point of view in a small hospital. We have this uh, man with chest pain. We are not sure about what to do with him. We go with the pocket echo. As you see the ECG, we don't have not so many uh, data to take decisions, but maybe we could see some kind of hypokinesia here, maybe also here. We find uh, mitral regurgitation, so we could think, okay, something is wrong. That, that, that were the things that were wrong. The circumflex and the LAD. All AD. We made thrombolysis for inferior well, infarctation, and somebody makes X-ray. Oh, maybe we have problems. So we can go with the machine and look here and say, okay, no effusion and inferior akinesia. Now we are starting to, to see how, what is the problem. You need experience to, to see the wall motion abnormality. So maybe you need training for doing that. Not all the people will recognize the wall, cardiac wall abnormalities. So here we, we start with the problem. It's going to be a philosophical talk, my lecture. Uh, another example, thrombolysis. Uh, we made thrombolysis, we, we see ST elevation in the anterior wall, so okay, but we have heart failure. What is happening? Okay, we have hypokinesia of anterior wall, and we see something here, but we don't know about echo. Imagine that I see something calcium here. What? Well, that's are the bad news. That patient has severe aortic stenosis. With this machine, he will lose the diagnosis. So these are the real problems. So changing of perspective, what, does, what is the evidence-based things that we have about this technique? We have a lot of papers. Validation of the technology, feasibility, accuracy, usefulness. So if you see all this evidence, you will see it. it's a very useful tool. Go for it. What do people think when they read these articles? Will the pocket provide bedside diagnosis? How can, uh, the opinion of the editor was, how can we best apply this technology to improve the patient care? Or it will the, the technique for the point of care, uh, it could be also, it will help to facilitate the delivery of cost-effective quality care. Again, we speak about in the talk before, and it could be interesting. This, this article is about one of the pocket echo and sending to the iPhone. This is the opinion of the editorialist. It says, maybe we are trying to save costs, maybe we are organizing bad things, maybe he, that patients will need a good echo, not the pocket echo. And what is an echo machine? Uh, we have limits with this technique. We try from the cardiology point of view to keep a gold standard, that is the echo that we know. And what functionality we have with this machine? And the last phrase that for the future, if we are not clear what means to do an echo, maybe we lose the two things. The useful thing that it could be this technique for physical examination and the value of the high-end echo. So we have to be careful. So these are the, the critical issues that we face with these machines. What are scenarios? What are the potential users? The competence levels of the users, and even how to storage and the reimbursement of this technique. As Piotr told, probably you will get not money to make physical examination. You get the money for making the physical examination as a consultant, but not to do the echo. So this is the handheld echo cardiography. This was 2002 when they started. The recommendation of the American Society of Echo were this, and these are the phrases that I want to point. Inappropriate use, inaccurate data acquisition, interpretation, training. This is the main thing, training. And obviously the problem of the reimbursement. There were better machines than the pocket echo. We have more options. So there were near echo. Why don't you get the reimbursement? So we come with the recommendation of the European Association of Echo. I will comment it because, as always, there are recommendations and you have to evaluate what they mean. They have, we have the recommendations for one side and for the other side we have the clinical scenarios. What are these clinical scenarios? We are going to discuss the two, these two parts. Well, as Piotr told us, what is a pocket echo? Limited functions, 2D and color, not Doppler, very important, not Doppler, and measurement package. This is the first thing. 
there's not eco machines like we could, you could read in recommendations, and the technical characteristics are the ones that Piotr uh, point before. We have technical characteristics and images quality that are sufficient for this. Evaluate left ventricular function to uh, evaluate a pericardial effusion like this, this was a tamponade, or maybe what is happening with the intravascular volume, or also if we have the calcification of a valve and even valve regurgitation. But you are able to m measure what, how much uh, regurgitation you could find here. It's impossible. You don't have tools for that. So you could say, okay, regurgitation. So what are the recommendations of use? I will say eight points. A cardiologist could do it, but many of these options are also for non-cardiologists. I will, so I'll, at least in my, it is my opinion, obviously, it's non -car in intensive care units, you have uh, sometimes it depends on the country, you have cardiologists, not cardiologists, so, but they will are able to use this technique probably if they, are, if they have in the hand also initial screening obviously in emergency, could be GP, some GP, internal medicine. So we have a lot of uh, medical specialties that could be using this machine. I suppose that point three and also point six will be done by the cardiologist. But they know the limitations of the technique. But I will show some examples that are not well related with these recommendations. So we will take uh, a pause to take uh, air, and we will look what scenarios we have uh, in this moment with some examples from literature. So we have this is scenario, this is published in JACE, and it's what to do by cardiologists. This is important thing because they say that after doing the echo, pocket echo, they send patient home, and they feel sure that it's good, a good diagnosis. So maybe that patient could could have not come to the consultation, probably, because if you don't need also the echo. So this is the first thing. You solve a patient with an echo, and probably it's not related with the recommendations that say, okay, you need complete echo. This cardiologist says, no, I could fin find final my study with the pocket echo. And by the other side, you can find surprise, like a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or maybe a dilation of the heart, so you will send it to the echo. And maybe the patient for the symptoms that told, maybe will not need did the echo. You will not order that echo. But with the pocket, you find this is. So this is one side of the coin. We have a, a problem that is uh, for uh, looking for different things in physical examination. Obviously, if you get with the, this machine, you will get more information. It's, I mean, I'm sure that with physical examination, you don't get the, uh, how much um, the thickness of the, of the cardiac wall. It's impossible by physical examination. So we'll find a lot of things put in the machine over the patient. The wet patient coming from endocrinology and oncology. And if you make the comparison between trainees and experts, they get, for these details, a good sensitivity and specificity. So if with short training, I will show what kind of training they did you could manage to see things with these machines. We can influence what the diagnosis of the patients with these machines, yes, and with a few time doing the, the technique, because as you see, two minutes from 13 minutes, you could change the diagnosis. If you see in this area coming from Norway, you could say that they verify the diagnosis in some cases, but also added new diagnosis with the machine. This is an example of the changes that they made of diagnosis. They, this is for cardiac uh, cardiologists, but they made the same study with internists and cardiologists in a medical department, and it happens the same. N not so many changes in the diagnosis, but they add more diagnosis. So it will be a useful tool if you are able to have it. You could see this uh, is not readable, but it's examples of all the diagnosis they changed in the paper. So it's interesting to see what they found. And what about GPs? If you trained them with eight hours, they were, used, they were able to measure the displacement of the mitral ring, that is something related with the left ventricular function. And compared with expert, they don't have a very big error if you compare one mil, 0 0.1 millimeter. So, and they get the standard view in, in near 90% of the cases. So it could be useful for screening of heart failure patients. 
And what about emergencies? These are two examples from intensive care unit and a cardiologist in a good care setting. If you see in this one, they have a very good concordance with the high-end machines. And if we take the cardiology side in this example, they, would, they were good uh, in the systolic function and in the pericardial effusion. But as you see, they were not perfect. Why they are not perfect? Because they are looking for grades. If you try to grade something, you start to lose concordance. Look for right ventricular size. Very bad. And they were cardiologists. So imagine if you don't have experience. And this, this is the last example that we want to show you that is it's made in the US. And this was if the pocket mobile echocardiography is the next generation stethoscope. I feel it could be, in my opinion. But it's, as I said before, it's philosophy thinking in this case. And they uh, train fellows with only two months of basic echo. They came from cardiology. So maybe they are well oriented, more or less. In, in their indirect experience before uh, the basic echocardiography training, and also for this, uh, how to say, easy findings, they have a very good concordance with the experts. If you see, okay, the attendings were better always, but not so bad. So not so many time to learn things. So uh, to summarize all this evidence, I will take these three, three slides coming from EuroEcho. Potential users. As you see, community screening, pre-hospital emergency, and hospital. A lot of people could use these machines. So we come here, very powerful. We've showed many clinical utility and cheap, easy to use, dangerous. Why is dangerous? Because you need training, and it's, uh, that's the point. And it's a machine that has no brain, so you have to use your own. So it's a problem. You need training, and I will come back th there after. Uh, what are the recommendations? I will do short comment to the recommendations. Do not complete a, complete a diagnostic echocardiographic examination. And there are some indications. For me, the eight indications probably are too many. Because you, are, you open the, the hand to a lot of scenarios, and maybe you need some kind of control. So this is something that it's my, it's my particular opinion. What happened with the national rules for technical examinations? Not always there are clear national rules. This is another problem. What happened with the third recommendation? With the exception of cardiologists who are certified for transthoracic echocardiography, uh, the certification should be limited to the clinical question that can potentially be answered by pocket size devices. So, do we need to rule this? And who is, going, who is going to rule this thing? I think probably the, the societies with, with, will take the rule of this. The cardiac societies, I don't know, maybe imagine societies, who knows? The patient has to be informed that the examination with the current generation of pocket-sized imaging devices does not replace a complete echocardiogram. Well, I showed you data from cardiologists. Do we need more information sometimes? That's, that's the point. If you are sure that what you are making the examination, you need more information. So what do you need for training? In this, in this uh, job, they say in this paper, uh, as you can see, uh, 15 hours of instruction about basic principles of ultrasound and three months of training. Made near 150 uh, studies. And you will be able to recognize these things that Galderasi showed in his uh, paper. What, what, what is the next step? Maybe it's, it's not enough? Well, there is a recommendation uh, recently published by the Italian chapter, and they recommend personal performance of more than 75 exams, interpretation of at least three, 350 exams, six months of training, and maintenance of competence. It's very important. And they, they, this is the theoretical problem that they propose. What are the common indications for using this machine? And what they have to recognize? What is the cardiac pathology that they have to recognize? There's a lot of things that they have to recognize. Even tetrajoli of Fallot, an example of complexity. So this is my last slide. We are near to finish. Uh, this is a proposal of learning model of pocket echocardiography. You have to take the theoretical part. You have some scenarios that you have to learn, probably, evaluation of uh, dyspnea, the shortness of breath, chest pain, shock, palpitation, heart murmurs, 
the self-assessment, very important, and also certification, and probably hands-on training. Somebody who knows must evaluate this. So I come to the answers. Do you remember that man was a, a, a question, when I should do it? When I need it? I think it's the, the, real, quest, the real answer. But knowing the limitations. That we have a lot of limitations with these things. And what, what will we say our judge? Anybody will try it who do it, but that's the main thing that is not really solved yet. Who must be, how, how must be this training? And how, who must rule the training? My last reflection is, this is like putting doors in a grass field. It's a Spanish saying, you know, who is going to control this? And who is going to stem the tide? It's the same in English. We have the machines in the market, so we need to put order here. This is the first step. The next step was this. And maybe in the future we can do diagnosis like a CT scan, like in Star Trek. Who knows? Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rafael, for this excellent presentation indeed. Are there any questions from the comments or questions from the audience? If not, perhaps we can ask our web moderator. Uh, yes, uh, um, Dr. Konstantinos from Greece asks us uh, if uh, the pocket echocardiography is going to be introduced to the clinical and emergency guidelines, and if so, when? Do you have uh, any ideas of that? I, I, I seen a presentation last year about emergency echo in, in EuroEcho, where the guidelines are in development. I'm not sure about that, that, that question. I'm not, I don't have access for that. Probably some, th some lines will, will be needed for this, for this, I, and, and for this, I'm sure. All right. And uh, my question is, the pocket-sized echo is considered the most advanced stethoscope. Um, do you think that uh, the training should be shift, that it should be a shift in training uh, to provide it in, during the graduate uh, uh, for students? And how, how do you do it in, in Spain? Do you, do you, is it included in, in graduate training for students is echo included at all? In echo Spain, it's not, it's not yet included. I think it's, it's new technology, not yet available, not so many centers. I think they have a pocket echo. Maybe in the future, the physical examination will change with this, but I think all the specialties want to know ultrasound. In, I don't know, even surgeons for abdominal problems, they want to know how to do it. So it's, 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 it's there. So I think it will change the, the training. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael, and we will move on to the next speaker, Dr. Fontes Carvalho from Portugal, and the talk will be about the real-life evidence of usefulness for non-experts. Dear Chairman, uh, dear colleagues, dear virtual audience at home, um, it is a pleasure to be here to present a technology that I believe has the, pot uh, the potential to, um, to change the way how we practice cardiology in the future. After these two excellent presentations, uh, almost everything has been said about Pocket Echo, so I will try to do is to show how, with the several clinical cases how we can apply this technology efficiently in our clinical practice. When I see a new technology, when I have a new problem, either in cardiology or either in life, I usually like to see the dark side of the, th of the thing, and I usually like to think about the limitations, the dangers and pitfalls, because if you know them, you can overcome these limitations and have a more efficient use. And here is no exception. If you know that this is not a complete echocardiogram exam and that this only provides a SME quantitative analysis and that you should probably use for some of these things, you probably will, have, will use it more efficiently. Uh, nevertheless, you will see that there is a whole branch of uh, a whole range of uh, clinical scenarios where you will use your pocket echo efficiently. Starting with the emergency department, some practical clinical cases that I had. This patient with cardiovascular um, risk factors came with a retro sternal chest pain. His first uh, troponin assessment was negative, and he had minor changes, as you can see here, in his EKG, also in the 
the inferior wall. Be, uh, according to our institution protocol, we decided to perform in the emergency department a cardiac CT to see the coronary arteries, and we could see that the patient had no significant coronary disease. And the patient was about to be discharged home without, uh, uh, without a diagnosis. But because I had the pocket echo for um, two weeks, more or less, I decided to perform in this patient the pocket echo. And to my uh, surprise, when I started doing, I, I could see a normal LV function, but you can start seeing here that there is an asymmetrical hypertrophy of the septum also here in the anterolateral wall, as you can see. Uh, here it, you can see it. You can use the pocket echo also to do some measurements. It's not easy. And uh, afterwards, as I said, it has limitations. You should do a detailed echocardiographic assessment, as you can see, but it confirmed the, the, what we have already seen with the pocket echo. Of course, that these patients benefit from tissue Doppler assessment, of course, and after the, uh, the patient performed uh, cardiac MR last week, and actually he had fibrosis, so the diagnosis of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was confirmed in this patient, which was something that we were not expecting. Another very interesting clinical case. Um, this old man, this old woman was found at home uh, and actually he had a stroke. There was a previous history of shortness of breath on moderate efforts. His brain CT had showed here the, the, the stroke. The patient was in sinus rhythm. And because the patient, because the neurologist who saw the patient saw, thought that this previous history was a bit strange, also the presentation of the clinical case, they asked me to do a cardiac assessment to the patient. And I do the clinical history, everything, of course. And, and then when I performed the pocket echo, you could see immediately that there was a, a severely impaired uh, LV function. And to my surprise, when I did the epical view, I could see here at, in the apex this small image here that you can see here with a, in a zoom mode, I would say, uh, with a better depth. The, you can see this image here. Of course, this is only a a SME quantitative assessment, so you should do, again, the detailed echocardiography. Here it is, uh, uh, LLV thrombus uh, in, the, in the apex, and with 3D uh, echocardiography that we also perform, you can see it here very well, and using a view from the interior of the, of the left ventricle to the apex, you can see very well the, uh, the thrombus. So it was possible to start immediately the treatment for this patient. This is a, a common case of a rapid atrial fibrillation patient coming to the emergency department. In this kind of patients, everybody likes to know LV function, LA size, uh, if there is mitral regurgitation, and the pocket echo in the acute phase allows you to do that. As you can see, the patient is in uh, rapid atrial fibrillation. You can see quite easily that the patient has some hypertrophy, that the left atrium is a bit enlarged, and you can see that he only has probably a mild um, mitral regurgitation. You can do those measurements if you want to confirm, but it can improve your clinical practice because, for instance, in this patient with hypertension and with LV hypertrophy, if you follow the guidelines, probably if you choose to do an, an antiarrhythmic therapy, you should not use one of these agents and probably you should prefer amiodarone for this patient. Some clinical cases, not from the emergency, but from your cardiac consult. Um, the, it is well validated in, the, in that study. Uh, this was a, a woman coming without uh, any complaints, but he was sent because the general practitioner heard uh, a systolic murmur um, in this uh, in this woman, and then uh, performing immediately uh, the, um, the the assessment, you can easily see that. The, the, this aortic valve is not that bad. It, it has some stenosis, but it's, you have to uh, agree that this is not a severe aortic stenosis and that the patient had uh, a, a moderate mi a mitral regurgitation. So the question is, uh, uh, and which is the challenge of the, of the topic of the, se of the session, if we still need uh, the cardiac aus auscultation uh, because finally after... 200 years of development, we now have uh, a visual stethoscope that probably can improve our clinical practice. The, the, this uh, uh, clinical case also from the cardiac consult is also very interesting because this was a patient who was being assessed for the first time in the cardiac consult. He had a uh, two-year duration heart failure um, clinical history, and when he came, 
uh, when she came, she, I performed immediately uh, the pocket echo in the, in the same time, and you can see easily that this uh, left ventricle is already very enlarged, and you have no doubt that this is a significant mitral re uh, aortic regurgitation that afterwards, of course, you need to assess better. Here it is, again, the, the ventricle enlarged, and you have no doubt that this is probably a severe aortic regurgitation. Afterwards, as I said, we performed again the detailed echocardiography with PISA and all, Vena Contrata and all those assessments, and also using the new technologies for 3D PISA assessment, as you can see here in these images, which help us in the assessment of some, of some patients. And this patient was easy because we had no doubt that this was a severe aortic regurgitation, which allowed us to um, start treatment to the patient more quickly. To, for, to conclude, some cases on the cardiac intensive care unit, of course, that it is not going to, we are not going to use pocket echo in this kind of uh, patients with, uh, uh, with the two um, left ventricular system devices, but you still can use it for many things, especially in patients with myocardial infarction. Uh, you can use it for LV uh, function assessment, wall motion abnormalities, mechanical complications, but as Raphael said, my main issue is here is that you need need some experience to assess correctly the LV motion abnormalities. You have no doubt here in this epical this, this kinesia. Another clinical case that shows you how this can be used, and I think this is quite useful. The patient uh, in my last uh, emergency um, department when I was uh, doing a night shift uh, came with an acute chest pain with one hour duration. You had no doubt that this was an inferior and posterior uh, ST elevation myocardial infarction. But my point is here, look at the AKG hour, it's here, and look afterwards to the, the time after assessment and after initiating therapy when it was possible to start immediately performing the pocket echo while the patient was being prepared to go to the cath lab. You could immediately see the LV function. You he see here that this wall is not moving. You can detect any kind of complications. You can detect if there is valvular problems. And this can be important, for instance, for the, uh, the interventional cardiologist to select the type of stent, if the, go the, if the patient is going to surgery or not. And this was the, the cath lab of this, uh, of this patient. A patient also that we had in our uh, cardiac care unit, that you, it, which was in cardiogenic shock. And these patients, of course, it is important to assess not only LV function, also to assess you have no doubt that this is a functional uh, or ischemic uh, mitral regurgitation. It's difficult to quantify but with this method, but it is also important also to assess the inferior vena cava, and you can see here that this inferior vena cava is not so dilated, so we could probably give some fluids for this, um, for this patient. And to conclude, there are some situations after invasive cardiology procedures where pocket echo can be useful. Sometimes we are called, especially after this kind of procedures, for instance, in procedures where you have to do uh, uh, transeptal puncture to detect if the patient has pericardial effusion, for instance, after uh, atrial fibrillation ablation or any kind of invasive procedure with, with transeptal puncture, uh, oh, and also after cardiac surgery. I will show you some examples. This is a very recent example that we had in our department. The patient was sent to, they asked me to see, the patient was not well, he was tachycardic, uh, he was hypotensive, and after a left atrial appendage closure. And uh, although we do this procedure with the uh, guidance of 3D echo, and we, we guide the transeptal puncture with uh, 3D echo, as you can see here, and also, as you can see here very well, the catheter passing through the interatrial septum, there are always situations where you have th doubts about if there is any kind of complications. Here you still can see the transesophageal echo of the device being deployed in the, in the left atrial appendage. Here is the device implanted in the left atrial appendage. And afterwards, as I said, they called me to, to see if there was any pericardial effusion. You can see no pericardial effusion in this patient. And actually, if you look 
carefully, you can see here the device the, that has been implanted, and if you do some angle, angulation, you can see it also again here in the left atrium. Of course, this is not to assess if the device is correctly implanted or not, but the question is you can still see that. To conclude, the last clinical case, um, it was a patient, very recent, also after cardiac surgery, it was a difficult patient, which after cardiac surgery, uh, five days after surgery, he was hypertensive, he had oliguria, fatigue, sleepiness, and the patient was not well. And they called me to, to do some kind of assessment to the patient. I went to the, the thoracic surgery department, and I could see that... Uh, at the, first see, at, the, at the first glance, that the prosthesis seemed okay, uh, nothing at all. But then, when I performed the subcostal view, you can see very well here, you can see the, the right ventricle compressed, the atrial, the, left, the right atrium also compressed, and a mass here, which seems uh, strange. You had no doubt that the inferior cava was dilated, and you could see this pericardial effusion with this fibrin inside. So... With this and the clinical assessment, the patient was immediately sent to surgery, and actually this was what we were seeing with the pocket echo, this enormous clock in the pericardium. So my main conclusions would be, uh, pocket echo actually can improve your everyday cardiology practice in several clinical scenarios, and I think that I uh, have shown some good examples of this. Um, you can use it efficiently, again, if you know their limitations and possible pitfalls. And as Raphael said, we always have to use our, our minds and because this actually is a machine. And you should use it to address specific clinical questions, not uh, an indifferentiated echo. You should use it to see what you want to see. Um, and possibly uh, there could be the validation in the future to use in other situations. I can see a potential for being used by cardiologists outside the hospitals. If you go to general practice uh, um, hospitals, not hospitals, but uh, centers. Um, I have serious doubts about their use in the ambulance because who will be performing this? This requires training, as Raphael said. Probably it can be useful for screening programs, it possibly in athletes. I think there is a potential for this. But you should be careful, not only with off-label use, because you can use it off label for a lot of things. For instance, here, an example of an off-label use. LV contrast in the, in the ventricle, and here you can see a thrombus with the with the, with the pocket echo but of course that nobody is going to use pocket echo with contrast because it destroys all the bubbles it makes no sense but you can see it but this is an off label use another off label use is to see prosthesis of course that nobody is going to assess prosthesis if they are working correctly with the pocket echo but again you can still see that this prosthesis seem okay you can use it to see masses and endocarditis, but probably is not the best um, method. And we should be careful, not only with off-label use, but I would say with half-hand uses. Because this can be a great invention. It's not the wheel, of course, but uh, this can be a great invention. But we have to, it, it can be problematic if it falls into wrong hands. And it is very important, the experience, the expertise of the operator. All these studies have been performed by experienced operators, so it has been validated when performed by experienced operators. And who should do it? I think that every cardiologist should do it uh, because the, in the core curriculum also there is a recommendation that for this kind of assessment, every cardiologist should have the expertise to perform, to perform them. I think that probably other doctors can perform it, but with careful and detailed and regulated um, uh, formation programs. And we are all here probably cardiologists. We always like to look at the heart because we think that uh, the heart is the most beautiful organ. But probably there are uh, also other nice things that you can see with the pocket echo. Uh, not only the heart, but also other nice things. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rafael, for this great talk. Um, do we have questions in the audience? Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you very much. With, with the new uh, ESC uh, recommendation for uh, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndromes, now there's a new recommendation for echocardiography uh, for every patient as soon as possible. Um, if the operators are experienced or if we train the, the emergency room physicians uh, who are actually first meeting those patients to actually fulfill this recommendation of echocardiography for every patient, do you think uh, this machine would suffice and it would ful fulfill this recommendation? Does it have to be a full echo? I mean, um, my personal impression is, is it would probably be fine. Um. My opinion is um, for a first assessment, as I, as I showed, it can be useful in the emergency setting, but again, perform either by cardiologists or by people with careful formation in pocket echocardiography. But I think that after a myocardial infarction, it doesn't have to be in the first 24 hours, but after the patient is discharged home, I think that still we should do a complete echo in every patient with myocardial infarction. Thank you. Do we have some questions from the virtual audience? Yes, we have several questions. We have uh, one from, uh, from uh, Buenos Aires, actually, from Dr. Ortiz, uh, who asks, what about stress echo for fast-track uh, chest pain units? Would it be suitable for that, you think? Stress echo? Yes. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. No way. Not for now, probably in the future. We don't. Yeah. Yeah. This equipment has limitation, and uh, uh, if the equipment has limitation, the operator cannot have limitation. I believe this should be operated by people who are thorough, well-versed with the standard equipment. Only then it's going to give us results which are useful. Secondly, a patient does not come to us with myocardial infarction. He is going to come to us with chest pain, dyspnea, and it is where this equipment has a role. Like I said, in areas where pleural effusion, massive effusions are common causes, and patients are there being investigated for their cardiac condition, leaving aside the whole big effusion on the side, which is the cause of dyspnea. And uh, then let us remember it aids therapy. If you have found a heart normal, all that you require to put the probe on the chest, and if you get a large effusion, you are guided by the, your probe and just put in a needle. It solves a lot of problem in a very short time and very economically. Yeah, I agree with you. It helps. It can help to guide uh, this kind of uh, procedure. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. I think it's important to notice that, of course, th those devices have limitations, but they have also a potential for future improvements and advances, maybe even incorporation more advanced advanced technique. And I would like to ask you, Ricardo, do you, I think the, the, the good example is uh, smartphones. They, they are becoming more popular and the fun functionality is clogged approaching the, the one that, of larger machines, computers, but uh, they do not replace them. So I would like to ask you, Ricardo, do you think that there is the, the possibility for future uh, increase in those advanced techniques used, echo techniques used in, in such small devices, and how would it have an impact on, on, car, on its current status? Uh, of course, that uh, evolution in the future is difficult to foresee, of course. Um, but uh, in the future, I'm sure that will be major developments in this area. And probably if you can couple with this kind of devices, for instance, a Doppler evaluation, there will, it will open a whole branch of new clinical scenarios where it can possibly be used. But um, this is not, uh, at uh, a short time, is not, uh, we cannot see it yet, but probably in the future, we, what, we'll, what I see is that probably instead of a, an iPhone or with an iPhone uh, that we use to, to talk with uh, everybody, probably it is possible to insert a probe uh, and to uh, start doing a pocket echo to the patients. I hope this can be the future. I have a short question. You said that, of course, people need to be trained uh, mm -hmm. to use the, those pocket devices. Do you think that they need only to be trained 
uh, with these pocket devices or also with standard echocardiography and to be uh, expert or at least train uh, to do a standard echocardiography to use these pocket mm -hmm. devices? Very good question. Um, I think that is a, an important issue because um, from our experience, and we, do, we give some formation to non-cardiologists, for instance, from the emergency departments, um, and we see two things that First, I, I agree and I, ha I think that the, uh, they should have formation in complete echocardiography because it is the only way that you know the limitations of this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, devices. And the second thing that I see many times is that patient, uh, this, uh, the doctors start, uh, they do like a three months formation in, in, uh, in echocardiography, but if they don't keep practicing, if they only do that once a week because they have a lot of other uh, acute care pa uh, acute patients and everything, they forget easily and they still call us again to the ICUs and to the emergency departments to do to the ECHO. So it is important not only the certification but recertification in this kind of uh, uh, scenarios. Right. Thank you so much and I think we have to move on. The next speaker is Ivan Stankovic from Leuven. Belgium, and his presentation opens with the statement, beware of the dangers, then providing the real-life evidence of problems and pitfalls with clinical cases. Ivan. Dear Laura, dear Lucas, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for your invitation. I have nothing to disclose regarding this talk. Uh, speaking of dangers, uh, my first concern would be the price of the device that looks like a smartphone. I would constantly be afraid that I will leave it behind in, in a patient's bed or simply drop it, like I do with my mobile phone several times per year. And I think that you would agree that uh, losing or damaging your $10,000 echo device could be indeed devastating. But if, if you leave this potential danger for doctors aside, why would any echo device uh, be dangerous? Uh, or, in, or in other words, why and when do we make mistakes using echo? They can occur during both image acquisition or interpretation due to poor patient echogenicity, uh, inadequate echo systems, uh, when reading limited, incomplete echo studies, especially in emergency settings, and a learning curve always plays a role. Simply put, we make mistakes if we cannot see or if we don't understand what we see using echo. But what would be potential sources of pitfalls that are specific for pocket echo devices? There's no deformation imaging and no 3D echo, but at least at present it's not a major issue. There's no spectral Doppler. Uh, sector angle and screen are smaller, and that can be a source of pitfall from time to time. Uh, and finally, they're less expensive. Uh, that translates to far more affordable, and they can fall into untrained hands. That can be indeed dangerous. Uh, in patients with good echogenicity, as shown by Prince and Falk last year, uh, there is impressive 2D echo quality with pocket echo device, and that quality is quite comparable with full echo systems, and that should not be a problem. But when echogenicity is bad, uh, the image quality is slightly better with full echo device, and we should consider referring patients for full echo system when we have patients with poor echogenicity. Sector size is smaller, which is usually not a problem, but sometimes it can be a problem. As you can see, there is a pericardial infusion in this patient, and it's, it's, you can easily appreciate it with full echo system. But if you use a pocket echo, due to small se sector size, you, you can miss it. It's still there, it's visible, but it's not so convincing as with uh, full echo. Uh, color Doppler is too sensitive with pocket echo as shown by Prince and Fogt. Uh, it may happen that you will overestimate uh, regurgitant lesions like, lesions, like in this patient with mitral regurgitation. Uh, as you can see, it's only mild with full echo device uh, and uh, it's moderate with pocket echo. And uh, the same goes uh, with this tricuspid, tricuspid regurgitation. But if you respect all these limitations, uh, handheld devices are real real imaging tools, certainly not toys, and device-related errors are probably unlikely to occur. On the other hand, operator-related errors uh, are perhaps very likely, even though nothing has been published uh, on this topic. But due to the lack of competence and education, uh, two types of errors can be expected, false positives and uh, false negatives. 
Here's one example of false positive error. For those with, without enough experience and training in echocardiography, it may become difficult to distinguish between the real right atrial thrombus and incidental findings uh, in the right atrium, such as Chiari network in this patient. These errors are less dangerous, but they may lead to increasing costs due to additional unnecessary testing, like in, like in this example, where the patient is with an artifact mimicking aortic dissection in the ascending aorta. But uh, to make a clear distinction, to rule out real aortic dissection, you need at least transits of a GL echocardiography, which was done. But again, this, this is probably less dangerous, and uh, perhaps most unfortunate are those without, uh, with false negatives uh, errors. Like in our first case, uh, this is a young male undergoing medical screening for driver's license. Uh, there were suspicious Q waves in the infralateral leads, and he remembers having chest pain three months ago, but at that time he had a thoracic herpes zoster and he was not paying a lot of attention to it. Now he's apparently healthy and denies having any complaints. Uh, he, seems to be a, he seems to be a perfect candidate for pocket echo, and if you look at the image quality, uh, it's just perfect from both parasternal and apical views, and basically there was nothing that could have been linked to observed ECG changes. So what would be a pitfall in this case? In non-medical imaging, this type of pitfall would be immediately recognized. This image will be discarded and replaced by proper one, like in this case. But it's not so easy in, in medical imaging. Pro basically, the same happened in our patient. Due to poor imaging technique, the true apex was cut. It was not there, but is this kinetic with thrombus. And uh, the diagnosis was missed. And this happens from time to time. And this example, uh, this example is all, only here to remind us that echocardiography, especially pocket echocardiography, is only easy to apply but not to perform, and and should be performed only by those who are properly trained. Uh, as shown by previous previous speakers, uh, echocardiography is a powerful tool to assess left ventricular systolic function. Uh, a trained eye can easily distinguish between. Uh, preserved and depressed left ventricular ejection fraction using only grayscale images. But are the grayscale images enough to rule, uh, to rule out heart failure, like in this 60-year-old patient with increasing shortness of breath, who is also hypertensive, obese, and dyslipidemic? Due to obesity, uh, the image quality is far from perfect, but we can still be sure that ejection fraction uh, is preserved, but we cannot be sure if this is a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And uh, at least now, it, there are several indices, uh, echo indices derived from floor tissue doppler to assess the stolic function, but at, at least at present, they're not available with, with pocket echo, and this can be a source of pitfall, especially if we take into account increasing prevalence of this entity, and that survival is just slightly better than in those with reduced ejection fraction. Nevertheless, uh, this shortcoming of pocket echo can be circumvented if we, play, if, if, if we pay close attention to morphological features reflecting long-standing diastolic dysfunction, such as left ventricular hypertrophy of left, left atrial enlargement. And uh, these both features, uh, morphological features, were present in our patient, and the only pitfall one can make with pocket echo is reporting no major findings of echo and not referring patient to examination with uh, a full echo system. What we should also keep in mind is, it was already mentioned by someone from the audience, that uh, patient quite frequently come without clear diagnostic questions. Uh, they come in with non-specific complaints such as dyspnea, dizziness, syncope, for which there are a number of potential causes. And echocardiography, and especially pocket echocardiography, cannot exclude them all, and we should not even try to do that. Here's one example. Uh, this is a 63-year-old uh, sedentary woman uh, who started physical fitness after retirement for the first time in her life. And uh, she felt a severe dizziness during the first session. Uh, physical examination, halter ECG, and neurological workup were all unremarkable. Significant coronary artery disease was excluded non-invasively by CT angio, and she was referred for echocardiography. The exam was done, and there were no major findings. Uh, on echo, she was reassured that it was nothing wrong with her heart, that she continued, she, she 
to try to continue training, and she almost fainted uh, with, uh, during the next session. She was finally uh, referred for stress echocardiography, uh, which provided perfectly good explanation for her complaints. As you uh, can see from here, uh, there is a dynamic uh, left ventricular outflow obstruction. It can be only during the stress. There is nothing at baseline. And uh, you can better appreciate it from epical long axis view. Uh, especially from the zoom mode. Later on, it was easy. Um, continuous wave Doppler uh, showed typical late peaking gradient of almost 130 mill millimeters of mercury. And this is an example that should remind us that even though echocardiography is, is a key piece of many cardiac puzzles, it may become puzzle itself if it's uh, used without proper reasoning. That, that's a brain part uh, from, from previous two speakers. Finally, echocardiography and pocket echo may save lives in the emergency department, providing rapid and reliable diagnosis of many cardiac emergencies, such as cardiac tamponade, pulmonary embolism, or aortic dissection. But on the other hand, it may be a source of potentially catastrophic errors. Echocardiography in the emergency department is a highly demanding procedure due to critically ill patients, stressful environment, time constraints, uh, image acquisition is difficult, and your decisions are critically important, and it should not even be attempted by non-experienced users. I will try to convince you with my last two examples. The first one is 64-year-old woman uh, presented with a hypertensive crisis. Uh, she also reported mild transient chest pain two hours before presentation to the emergency department. ECG and cardiac markers were unremarkable, and she had a good response to initial therapy. Quick look echo was done in order to rule out aortic dissection and wall motion abnormalities. And as you can see, the, the, there is a poor image quality from the parasternal views, and the only thing you can appreciate from these images is a, a dilation of the aorta, but this was something uh, known in this patient. It had been previously reported. Uh, epical views were better, and as you can see, uh, it's perfectly normal uh, regional and global LV function, and there is a mild aortic regurgitation. Uh, she stayed overnight. She was asymptomatic, and repeated echocardiogram was required in the morning uh, due to slightly elevated troponin levels. Uh, it was done on the same machine, but with different operator. And there are two striking differences. The first one is almost perfect image quality, and the second one, typical features of uh, intramural hematoma of the ascending aorta, which was completely missed with initial examination due to both acquisition and interpretation pitfall. In my last example, it's about 39-year-old female who is complaining of atypical, poorly localized chest pain lasting for, for 10 days. Again, ECG and physical examinations were unhelpful. And uh, on echocardiography, there is a, a perfect image quality from the beginning. Uh, again, mild aortic regurgitation and uh, unremarkable global and uh, regional LV function. What could be potential pitfalls in this patient, and both pitfalls were made uh, at first examination. The first one is uh, skipping the suprasternal view. But even if you, if you obtain it, uh, you can still make a pitfall if you do it with a pocket echo device without color Doppler capabilities. Uh, only with color Doppler, you may become suspicious of type 3 aortic dissection, which is the diagnosis in this patient due to turbulent, uh, turbulent and unusual color flow in the descending aorta. And once uh, you, uh, you raise suspicion, it's usually easy to find an intimal flap to track the aorta and uh, to, try, uh, to find the intimal trap separating the true and the false lumen and the diagnosis is, is here. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, pocket echo is indeed a powerful imaging tool, but it may become dangerous in inexperienced hands, and a key issue is education and training. This was recognized by, by our association, and educational program for pocket-sized echo devices is currently out, out, under development. It will comprise teaching, skills training, self-assessment, and certification, and it is expected to be launched uh, uh, during this Euro Echo, which is another good reason to see you all in Athens this December. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. 
Are there any comments or questions from the audience? Or do we have a question from our internet moderator? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Gart from uh, Sheffield, UK, wants to know if uh, if it would be necessary for this uh, on-spot uh, pocket echo to uh, make a full formal report. Uh, the first thing is to perform a full echo, to do as complete exa uh, examination as possible, and then to uh, to report everything you see. Uh, it's, it's important for many reasons. Uh, if you if you do repeat uh, echocardiogram later on, your colleague may uh, may compare his findings to your findings. And another thing is for medical legal reasons, especially in the emergency setting, it's extremely important to record and to make as, as detailed examination as necessary and possible, I, I think so. There is a question from the audience. Uh, could, <laughs> yes? No. No? All right. So there is another one. Uh, Dr. Rodox from uh, Norway. Uh, you say that um, uh, pocket echo in the emergency setting should not be attempted by uh, non-experts. Uh, but at the same time, you say that uh, the major pitfall is false negatives. Uh, That's right. And I, I agree with you on that one. But uh, what's it to lose by non-expert uh, performance if you then do as you always do the next day or the, on the following round? I think there is only one logical answer to this question is that maybe you should attempt but do not exclude. If you see something perfect, uh, if you I, I don't know, uh, ask for another imaging modality or uh, try to find another colleague's or senior staff member to make a consultation. But if you cannot see, don't uh, make a false sense of security uh, for yourself or for, for your patient. That, that could be a source of pitfall. That, that's then we agree point. fully. <laughs> once again and to conclude this uh, session it should be highlighted that uh, pocket sized echocardiography scanners uh, do not currently provide the complete uh, cardiac ultrasound study they are instead um, included as an expanded component into the physical examination of the patients and uh, therefore the uh, indications remain limited as compared to conventional echocardiography. But when the appropriate training is, is provided, those miniaturized uh, devices have the potential to be more commonly used in the future, and uh, further technical advancements cannot be excluded that could um, modify the uh, functionality of those uh, pocket size echo scanners. Uh, on behalf of a co chairman, Laura Hernand, I thank uh, all the uh, speakers for the excellent presentations on different aspects of uh, pocket sized echocardiography. And I thank all the participants, the ones on site here and the ones sitting in front of the larger or smaller screens. Thank you so much.